Okay, good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start the August meeting of the Mona Basin Historical Society. And thank you, Barry, for giving us the uh, thumbs up that we're good with, uh, with sound out there in Zoom land. And uh, we have a lot of folks here tonight. It's really nice. The word must have gotten out that we're giving a door prize out tonight. Yeah. And we've got great food tonight. We have got, uh, gosh, I think there's enchiladas, there's mac and cheese, there's beautiful salads, there's, I think, a cake and cookies and people that aren't here. I mean, you can't eat from Zoom. Okay. <laughs> So let's see. We've got a few reports. Um, is uh, Jarrett, can you give us the, um, Jarrett's out in Zoom land because he's up in Bridgeport and he's going to give us the Muncie Museum report. Jarrett, can you get on? Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, for the month of July, we have had over 1,022 guests at the museum. Guests have come from Poland. Um, Czechia, Mexico, Switzerland, Hawaii, Austria, England, Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Russia. We've collected over $761 in donations for the month of June. Um, as for my coordinator notes, Linda and I have finished a session in Tom Perenik's family history. We will start to incorporate them into the museum. Some files will go on display while others will be put in the Conway folder. Me and Lenore will be scanning photographs of Casus Mike and Mini Mike to be sent to Teresa Mike. We are working on a folder for the Mono Basin Chinese history to expand the Chinese history for the families who have ties in the Mono Basin. A new flag has been donated anonymously to our museum. It will replace our old flag. As always, I would like to thank Cole, Alden, Linda, Robin, and Lenore for all the hard work they do for the museum. Thank you. That is my report for the month. Thank you, Jarrett. That was awesome. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if uh, everyone attended our fundraising Saturday or not, but last Saturday was quite a uh, active uh, street here on Matley. We had um, artisan ice cream at the park and around the museum and at the pavilion. And then we had the Indian taco sale here. Uh, Priscilla, before, I'm uh, trying to get Priscilla before she takes a bite. <laughs> Can you come over and give a report? Thanks. Okay, hello. Priscilla Hawkins. So our fundraiser um, for the Mono Basin Historical Society is called Artisan Ice Cream. A lot of you heard me talk about it beforehand. And I want to mention the committee that worked with me, Linda LaPierre and Deanna Bone Rundle. And um, we had some donors. I want to be sure to mention them. We had the Mono Market. They donated two large tubs of ice cream and Hershey syrup. And the Community Presbyterian Church lent us seven tables, 43 reusable bowls, and 100 silver spoons. Because I, <laughs> I wanted to um, not use throwaway things. And so we, yay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so uh, we were able to borrow these from the church. Of course, we did have, I, f I figured, about 65 people who were um, um, having ice cream. So in between, we had to do a little washing of, of, the, of the bowls. But also, this was kind of nice, um, Cedar came along and he said, oh, I can take some of those and I'll put them in my dishwasher because he lives right next there to the museum. So that was very nice, yes. Um, we had eight different artists. I was really happy with the artists this year. See, last year, I think we had five and, um, the, and last year was our first year. And we had quite a variety of items. And I think I, I talked to all but one artist afterward. And all the ones I talked to said they had sold items. So they were quite um, happy with that. Um, oh, other volunteers I wanted to mention who helped out uh, that day were John Warnicke, Cole Hawkins, and Ugo Merguaya. Okay, the, now the money part. So, 
that was the idea to try to have a, a, be a fundraiser. We had two different jars and one jar was over by Linda as she was serving the ice cream because we did not charge anything for this event. We thought, well, let's, let's try it like this, see how it works. And so in that jar, there was $183. Mm -hmm. Then the other jar that we had um, over by the um, raffle ticket drawing that we had, um, and, that, and in that jar, it also included the um, $25 each artist only gave, we only asked them to give us $25, and we didn't take any of the, uh, their proceeds they made from things they sold. So in that jar was, back to the glasses. Um, oh, 401. $401. So we made a total of $584, which went to the museum. And I already gave that to Lenore, our treasurer. So good. And, and I know many, many of you came. I think pretty much everybody that I see here came. So thank you very much. Where's our lady? Robin Hope. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Priscilla. And these events take a lot of work and we really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much, Priscilla. Uh, Janice, are you available to give a report on the taco sale? Um, yes, I'm here. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know what the statistics are, Robin. How much did we make? We made after expenses $760. Yeah. Yeah, that was after our expenses. Awesome. That was really a great event. Thank you, everybody in the community and all the hard work by Robin, Lenore, and Chris. I really appreciate you guys covering the, the front lines and taking all the orders for us. Um, I had my crew with me. It was my son, Jared, and uh, my other son, Austin, Emily, and Amber. My two daughters, they, uh, they worked the kitchen and... Um, they know what to do. We really knocked out a lot of tacos and it was so much fun. Plus, you know, we got to eat a little bit too and we got to enjoy with everybody else. But I thought it was a great event. I'm looking forward to another one. Um, so we, we kind of know our little hits and misses, but it was so much fun. Anyway, I just wanted to tell uh, Robin and everybody, thank you guys so much for allowing us to come in and cook. And um, I got to share on my bed with everybody. So thank you. Thank you. It was, it really was amazing. I don't think I've ever seen flour flying like it was. And, and then um, Frank says that there is a saying in the service. It's either lead, follow, or get the heck out of the way. Lenore and I got the heck out of the way. We just took the money because <laughs> it, it was amazing. We started the, uh, we no more than got set up and Nancy Pinizzato came in and she ordered 20 Indian tacos. And so it was just boom, right off the bat. And she ordered 20 that she said, I'm going to come back for, cause I know it's going to take you a little bit, but I want one. Well, we found out later what she did is she was chumming the waters at the park and she walked around with the taco showing people at the park and letting them know where they could come and get one of these tacos. So Nancy was pretty amazing. And then when, um, as, as Jana said, we learned some things and we needed more, we learned that we needed more, have more supplies next year. And we were running out of sour cream and, um, and taco sauce. And Nancy heard that and it was just like the fairy godmother showed up with a gallon of each. And it, she was just amazing. So she, uh, she really bailed us on that. But we've, I figured we, it was probably 120 tacos that, uh, that they were pumping out of that kitchen. And, uh, and we didn't have use of the refrigerator. So because the, um, the tribe had, it was Cassetica days because the, um, it so happened that last weekend, the walk was starting. So they had the, and we only have one refrigerator here now. So they had the refrigerator all full. We did know about it ahead of time. So um, 
Janice had her, uh, she brought everything in coolers. And then we got coolers from Beavers along with ice for the drinks. So everybody just sort of came together to make an event that we had never done before. Uh, really successful. Uh, people wanted to keep stopping by. And they said, can we just tell people in the kitchen how wonderful things are? And they, they asked us to please do it again next year. So, so it was. It was really, really a great event. So let's see. Um, ghost tickets. They're on sale. And um, just a reminder, it's August 26 and 27. Uh, we can, you can either buy them at the museum or, um, or online. You can go to our website. I also put the link in the emails that I sent out about this meeting, or you can go to Eventbrite. And uh, they can be purchased from any of those places. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to have a drawing for the people that have bought tickets so far. And um, we're going to give away two wine glasses, upside down house wine glasses. And the neat thing about an upside down house wine glass is it encourages you to drink enough wine that the house is right side up. So, so. Jen, can you pull it for us? It's, um, let's see, we are at 31 for the um, dinner and 32, I'm sorry, 33 for the um, tour. Okay, yay, yay. And we've, we've got them here. So we can take care of that tonight. And let's see, Rebecca Watkins won the, um, the upside down wine glasses. So there we go. So we'll let Rebecca know. She bought four tickets. Okay, let's see if we've got anything else. Okay, I think we're about ready to start the presentation. Tonight's presentation, oh, Dave, did you wanna say anything more about the event, about Ghost? Yes. Chris, are you there? Chris Spiller? She could have, she could have her mouth full right now. Okay. I am I am here. I oh, can't seem there. to get my video on. That's okay. That's okay. Can you tell us about the interview that you're doing? Well, um, I had it all set up for this Friday with Joe Scanavino, who lives in Florida, and uh, Rich is going to do the technical stuff with the Zoom and record it, and he'll be able to edit it later. And the good news is I talked to him today and got you know things set up on friday and then he called me back later and said he had a medical appointment that day couldn't do it after all so i've sent you all an email see if we can set something up for two i think he said tuesday or thursday it's it's in the email to rich and and dave and you so that's where we're at on it but yeah he's eager to do it um he has never done zoom before so rich if you're here you you might want to chat with him a little bit <laughs> And then I did uh, put an announcement on our Facebook page, but I wanted to let everyone know that we've lost one of our old timers. Uh, Jim Stewart passed away, uh, I think it was July 17th, uh, at the age of 102 and a half. So Jim was uh, raised here in the basin. He went to school in our schoolhouse when it was up the road. Uh, he's given a lot of presentations for us at the ghost tours. And I just think there must be something about Mono Lake that it's amazing. We've got some, some people that live to be ripe old ages around here. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. So Peggy wanted, uh, wanted us to know. She said that, uh, that at 102 and a half, he went to sleep and stayed asleep and everything was beautiful. So he's no longer with us here, but he's watching over us. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm, this is Priscilla. I'm introducing a new friend of mine. She is a neighbor of ours. This is Ruth Garland. She's still part-time here, but eventually she, she may be full-time. Okay. Hi, everybody, this is Janet. Um, I just don't know if everybody's heard that Rebecca Watkins is moving on. She's, um, this happened, has happened since our last meeting and she's going to, um, be the pastor of a church in the, the Presbyterian Church in Virginia City. So uh, it's it's really sad to lose her, but I, it's a new adventure for her and challenge. Um, so we are planning to do some kind of farewell. Um, I need to talk to her this week about to pin down the date. So we will let everybody know it'll probably be at the church. And uh, yeah, that's coming up. Yeah. Rebecca has been very involved in the historical society. Yeah. So her last Sunday at church will be um, August 14th. Thank you. Yes, Rebecca was uh, a trustee for a long time. She uh, she really helped a lot with the bird breakfast last month and she just she's always there to to lend a hand. And so she's going to be really missed in our community. Anything else? Dave, do we have anything more on the ghost? Or are we good? Okay, it's coming along and uh, we just buy tickets, buy tickets. Okay, um, tonight's presentation is Human and Natural Landscapes, Changes in the Mono Basin as Seen Through Census Data 1900 to 1940. And Bob Marks is our presenter. Uh, Bob is a Professor Emeritus of History and Environmental Studies at Whittier, Whittier College. He's one of our trustees. And most importantly for me is he is our resident fix-it man at the museum. So... <laughs> We greatly appreciate those talents. <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> we're going to turn this over to Bob. Okay, we're going to we're going to do a little furniture arranging, I think. So are you done with me here? Hello? Okay. Can you, is this, I guess it's Zoom land. We need to know if they're out there <laughs> and can hear me. Uh, okay, so I think I've got everything going. This, I, I don't have any notes up here. This isn't uh, a lectern for me. Um, I have my uh, clock over here because um, I promised to uh, have this uh, wrapped up within 45 minutes or so. Um, it might go a little bit longer depending on whether or not you have any questions. So what I'm going to talk about is part of uh, research I've been doing um, on the Mono Basin for the past uh, two or three years. Um, I'm an environmental historian and um, when Joyce and I moved up here full time three or so years ago, I started doing um, an environmental history of the Mono Basin. I thought that was going to be the first step of an environmental history of the Eastern Sierra. But there is so much to do here, and <laughs> there's a lot, lot of work um, that I'm just so engaged with uh, the basin and with all of the documents and history that I'm finding that I can construct um, that people haven't actually touched yet in trying to tell the story of the Mono Basin. Um, so um, I've got a slide that's coming up here in a, in a bit that will show you some of the publications that I have out now and that are in process as well. Um, and I do want you to look at that to give you some idea of where I'm going and where this uh, presentation fits in. Um, but as a, a very brief um, and somewhat simplistic uh, model of environmental history, 
what we look at is the way in which particular environments condition the way in which people, which humans, can get their sustenance and build societies and have families and create their own histories. Um, and how those activities of humans then introduce changes, slow or fast or otherwise, to the environment, um, which create either opportunities or challenges that have to be overcome. And all we have to think about is the last 200 years of the modern world um, and climate change to get some sense of how that interaction works and how actually complicated it gets um, because it involves choices, it involves values, it involves all kinds of things that are much more than just simply the material relationship of bodies to other bodies and then the changes that all that um, entails. So <clears throat> um, tonight I'm going to be focusing on and using um, U.S. Census data. That's how I got started on this because what we need to know um, to do environmental history is what are the people? Who are they? Where are they? And so it turns out that it was more or less easy for me to access um, U.S. Census data for the Mono Basin. Um, now, there are five decades of uh, census data that's available online. Um, 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, 1940. The 1950 data uh, has recently come out in the la last month or two or so, um, and I took a look at it. It's impossible for me to use at this point, so I didn't look at it. So. Um, that's being left off. And I couldn't find any census data for Mono, the Mono Basin or even Mono County before 1900. So here we go, we've got that. Um, and for the purposes tonight, um, the Mono Basin, uh, I've defined more or less as what we can see. Um, I did not include Lundy, Mono Mills, um, or Bodie, which is kind of not in the basin realistically anyway. Um, for a lot of reasons. So we're looking at what we can actually see from the basin. Lundy, I'll get to you later. Mono Mills um, is included in the Benton census tract. Um, and also what is not included is, and we'll see this, what happens from 1930 on with the LADWP building West Portal and the number of people there because they, they're not there in 1930 and by 1940, there's only about 34 people left. So that's not a real, that's not a, not a big presence. Um, and so the, the title um, also is somewhat of a contradiction. It's um, human and natural landscapes. And you think we're gonna be looking at, it's not landscape paintings. I'm not gonna have a lot of photographs or pictures. I've got some, um, but there's a contradiction with that and data. You know, I like data. Data speaks to me. I question it. I say, are you really sure about that? No, I'm not sure at all. But anyway, so there's, there's gonna be data here. And I'm gonna show you uh, some of the, uh, the sheets from the US Census and a couple of other censuses as well, along with um, um, what's known as the Great Register of California and Mono County, which is the uh, register of uh, registered voters. We had them then, we had lists of registered voters and they could vote. And I'll show you one example of, of one poor guy in the basin, oh my God. Um, you'd wonder what, what problems he had. Anyway, so so, so that's where we're going. Um, and I'm going to, oh, I need a, a thingy. I need to be able to, yeah, which one? Big button, just the word clarity. Did I touch the big button? There you go, okay. Um, so there's various ways of conceptualizing the, uh, the basin. Um, oh, and I need to get my, uh, and Rich and I have, we're gonna try to work this out. I have a, okay, so he's gonna try to follow my laser pointer because the laser pointer doesn't show up on Zoom. So all of you Zoomers um, are gonna have to, that what's what's happening up there? That's Rich playing with a little thing with a red dot on it. Okay, so what we have there's a couple of uh, aerial you have aerial photograph. What happened? Did I do that? Let's go back. Okay, so we've got an aerial phot photograph, and we've got we've got um, a Google Earth, and these uh, in some ways uh, pretend to be 
uh, photographs of nature, um, of the natural environment. But as we know, um, these photographs are actually artifacts to a large extent of, uh, of human activity in the basin, not just the last 80 years of the results of the DWP taking all the water, uh, but the millennia of, uh, of activity of the Gazetica in, this, uh, in the Mono Basin as well and what happened there. Um, and then we got uh, overlays of uh, human activity here. Um, this is the hydro hydrography. This is by a, a, a botanist who put this together. Um, we've got uh, indications of other human activity, naming the uh, the natural places, Mill Creek, Levining Creek, and I'll talk a little bit more about Rush Creek. And then the uh, National Forest Scenic Area is not fully a nature preserve, but that is one of the purposes of the of the basin, um, is to preserve nature, even though it is a degraded nature um, as a result of of a century or more of, of human activity um, in the basin. Um, so, Rich, do I push? Which one do I push? Big button, big button. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. So, um, as I said, I've got uh, two articles that are out and published, and uh, I'm doing a little advertising here if you want. Um, two of these are available online, sort of as free downloads. Um, the first is uh, Sheep Replace a Pronghorn, and I'll talk a little bit about sheep not very much, Environmental History of the Mono Basin in 1900. And then uh, Mr. Clover Goes to Washington, Land, Water, and Fraud in the Mono Basin, 1910 to 1945. And this is uh, an a rather larger version of a uh, talk I gave at the Ghost Tour uh, last year. Um, but both of those are available in the Eastern Sierra History Journal. Um, you just go, on, go to that site and these will pop up and you can download them. Um, for free. I don't get anything out of it. You know, it's just there. We scholars do this. We want to know, and so we'd like other people to know as well. Um, and then I've got a couple of other articles that are in, in press. Um, one is called Before Mulholland, Land, Water, and Power in the Mono Basin, 1872 to 1923. Um, that's submitted to the Western Historical Quarterly. Um, and this is uh, uh, a reminder to our friends across the street in the Mono Lake Committee that history didn't start in 1941, you know, it's it's we we have a long history here um, before Mulholland, um, and then I'm I'm working on another article. Uh, this is uh, California Indian land allotments in the Mono Basin, 1907 to 1930, which I've submitted to uh, California History, um, and I'm also going to be doing that presentation at the late October meeting of the Eastern Sierra History um, Conference, ESIAS, which is going to be held this year, I think, in, uh, in Bishop. So I will be talking about that, and it's also been. Um, and I got a lot of other stuff I'm working on <laughs> trying to do. Um, but ultimately, I see this is all going to get tied together in, in, a, in a book, a history, which is a narrative that tries to make sense out of our situation here as well. Um, okay, so tonight, <clears throat> driven by documents and documentary evidence. Um, I didn't say this until about six years ago, but we historians live in an evidence-rich environment. We don't make shit up, you know? I mean, <laughs> Fritz does. But, you know, I mean, we got to be able to document. So I'm gonna, there's going to be some uh, documentation in here. Uh, U.S. Census, as I already mentioned, those voter registers, registration for, uh, for Mono Lake. Census is of Paiute Indians. Um, I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. Land ownership records, water rights records, and all of these documents need to be queried. We need to say, not just are you telling the truth and can you be relied on, but what are you hiding? What are you hiding? And I'm going to shake some of the hidden stuff out of these documents that look like they are simply telling the truth. But, you know, we'll see how much there is. Um, and what I'm gonna really focus on, focus on, in on, um, are farming and ranching and irrigating. What we can learn about those aspects of life and the role of Paiutes in all of this as well. Because unfortunately, they're left out of most of the narratives that we tell about the Mono Basin. 
Okay, so I'm going to go through uh, four or five sheets from the U.S. Census, just to give you some idea of what um, what these things look like. This is for the uh, uh, township, not the township, but the um, we we were called the Jordan. We were included in Jordan. Oh, okay. We were included in Jordan, and this was done by John Welch on the second day of June, 1900. And this is one of uh, nine or ten sheets. And I'm just going to show you one sheet here, so you can go back out again, Rich. Um, so we've got the name. Here we've got James Sturgeon. We've got other people in his household. Um, and since uh, we mentioned Chinese in the basin, here we have a guy by the name of Sam Waugh, lodger. China, 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 and he's a cook in James Sturgeon's household. Uh, we've got another Chinese cook down here, uh, Ah Fung, um, as well. Um, but we've got their names, the order in which they were visited. We have lodging or residence, and then we've got the number of families. And usually those coincide, you know, household or whatever, cause houses one family, sometimes there's two or three, and we'll see how that works as well. Um, We've got uh, their relationship, we've got their uh, ages, we've got when they were born, we've got where they're from. Uh, James Sturgeon is from Canada, his parents were from Ireland. Um, he became a citizen in 1864, um, and his current um, profession is as a farmer. Educated, read, write, and speak English, yes. And over here, I'm gonna, you can't see this, it says number of farm schedule. And so this numbers the farms. And uh, the uh, enumerators uh, were supposed to not just simply take, this is called uh, uh, schedule one. Schedule two was 10 or 12 pages on the farm itself. You know, how many acres, how many, what, what you're growing, what you're doing and everything else. Um, and so over here, we've got one, two and three. Um, anything else on there? Well, we can take a look at that. Um, the other thing that's in the, uh, the, the census is the Indian population. So what we've got over here, um, and I think there are only two sheets on the Indian population of uh, the Mono Basin in 1900. Um, again, John Welch, 14th day of June. Um, so we've got, uh, let's see, we've got uh, Bill McCowan, got some names of other Bridgeport Tom and the individuals in his household, um, ages, relationship, where they were born. And if we go over here again, um, we've got occupation and there's, there's a code here that I don't know what that code means, but we later on we get something, we use English like farmer, farm labor. Um, and down here, special inquiries, it's the same people in order. Um, nativity, Paiute, Paiute, Paiute. Um, oh, this is percent mixed blood. Conjugal condition, which means one or more wives, and they're interested in if there's more than one wives. And then dwellings. Is this Indian living in a fixed or is a movable dwelling? Movable, 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 and in 1900, they're all movable. They're all wiki ups that can be taken to the other side of the lake um, in the winter time. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these a little bit more quickly. Uh, 1910, got somebody who didn't take uh, uh, penmanship in school because it gets really difficult to read. But again, mostly of the same, same kinds of data over here. Um, and We've got farmers, we've got farm operator, farm operator. I had to learn how to read these guys' handwriting. We've got some women as well. Um, and the occupation is interesting and important. Then we've got ages, and then again, each and every family. We've got uh, Farringtons, we've got uh, Wilf, we got Jill Matleys, we've got uh, Peter Matley, we've got uh, a lot of, lot of names that, uh, that you would recognize from the history of, of of the basin of settlers. Uh, but again, we've got uh, 1910, a separate census for the Indian population. Um, Jake Charlie, uh, Henry Jameson, Bridgeport Tom, um, Sam George, or George Sam here. And then again, ages, 
um, the names of everybody in their uh, in their families, their relationship, um, and where birthplace birthplace of this person, birthplace of father of this person, and birthplace of mother of this person. Um, and so if you can get into a heck of a lot of data. So, Well, sometimes it says Tuolumne, sometimes it says Benton, sometimes it says Mono, Mono Lake, and yeah, it's it's not uh, disaggregated any more than that. Okay. Um, I didn't. I'd have to go back and look. I think there's uh, again there's ten or twelve uh, sheets of this. And I wasn't paying that much attention to it. Although I should tell you, I taught Chinese history for 41 years, <laughs> among other things. <laughs> OK. Yeah, and so here we have the special inquiries. And once you get over here um, to uh, uh, residence or dwelling, and here the now the question is whether or not the, the dwelling is aboriginal or civilized. Uh, look, I'm only using the language of, you know, 110 years ago. So I'm sure you'll all be happy to see that from movable in 1900, now all these folks are living in civilized, civilized, right? Oh, is this Indian tax? The state needs to know that. That's the most thing, most important thing about uh, being legible to the state is A, if you if you're taxed, and B, if you have any kids who can be drafted into the army. So those two things are important. Okay. Boy, the way you can zoom in and zoom up, Bruce, that's, that's really fabulous. Okay, so by the time we get to the 1920 census, you might think that this is uh, uh, an advance forward, but the Indian population and the white population are integrated onto the same sheet. So the same information that's being um, captured about the uh, the white population, the Euro-American settler population, is being captured about um, uh, the uh, the Paiutes as well. Um, and again, you have the uh, we've got Mike Williams here, Nellie Charlie, uh, Jenny Harrison, Cunningham. We got some. Then we're down into the the white folks down here. Um, again, citizenship, educational, personal description. So let's go over this way a little bit again. Um, no, I, I did. I did that. We got to go backwards. Go back to the 1920. There we go. So we're still looking at farm, at at farms over here, um, and we're up. We got 20 enumerated here, so we've got uh, a lot of lot of information. So we'll go to the next one. 1920. No, we need to go to 1930. But we're going forward. Oh, I, that's me. I'm doing that. Okay. Um, now, we've got an extremely well-written, handwritten sheet, right? And again, whites and Indians are included. We've got Ned Rambo's family here. Um, got Matt Lee's. You got Billup. Uh, this is the same guy who was uh, uh, over at the Mono Mills. Um, and much of the information is the same, except now we've got a value uh, placed on their residence. Okay, Henry, I can't read his last name here. His house was valued at $500 or so. Uh, place of birth, again, uh, California, Ned Rambo, California, full blood, um, Paiute. <laughs> In a, well, but it's civilized. Oh, right, in a $5 house, right, among other things. Let's see over here. Um, when we get to occupation, again, we've got farm operator, laborer on a farm, uh, labor housekeeper at a resort, um, cook, 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 truck driver. Anyway, you can get a sense of, of uh, virtually what everybody's doing in the, in the Mono Basin and how many kids they've had um, as well. So... Um, 1940 census. Oh, um, I forgot to show something on the 1920 census and the 1930 census. Over here, uh, they started 
No, we can, no. we can just go to the 1940 census as well because that shows it pretty clearly. Go to the next one. Here we've got um, US 395 at Grant Lake Road, which is where these folks are living. So we get a little bit closer sense as to where people are located um, in the basin. And uh, we've got uh, the Harrisons, we've got uh, Frank Sam, um, again, US 395 at Grant Lake Road, which we know is true. You know, this, this is documented, and the entire family as well. Um, 1940, let's go up to the top of the sheet. Uh, over this way a little bit, we got residents. Um, okay, employment status. You know, 1940, we're a, a decade into the Great Depression and people's employment status is really important for the state to know. You know, how many hours a week are you working? What are you doing? What's your job? Um, income in 1930, or I can't, 1930, yeah, income in 1930. Um, anyway, amount of monetary wages or salary resided, uh, I can't read that sideways. Anyway, we've got $800, $600, $350. I think that's probably the annual take. I don't think it's uh, monthly. They'd be living pretty high. Yeah, he's, he's, he's in here and his, his family as well. I just don't simply have that particular sheet up. Okay, so there's all these individual stories. And for those of you who are searching for genealogical information, you know, this stuff is like a gold mine. It tells you all kinds of stuff, but I'm not a genealogist. You know, this is just simply data for me. And I take it all and I put it into a sheet, a spreadsheet. So now we've got, I've aggregated all this data for 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930, and I've broken it down into white, Paiute and then total over here. And I'm also interested in households, persons, dwellings, and then farms, and we'll get to farms again. Um, but as you can see, in 1900, there were 39 households in the Mona Basin, accounting for a total of 150 farms, 37 dwellings of which 25 are farms or ranches. And there are, and we, I'll show you another sheet that I've got the names of all of those uh, farms and ranches. Um, 1910, slightly more, although the number of farms seems to have decreased a little bit. 1920, um, a slight decrease, probably as a result of dislocations from the war. Can you zoom in a little bit? Is that, June, can you, okay, yeah. Um, from 1920 to 1930, there's a significant increase in uh, the white population. Um, the uh, Paiute population remains about the same, and I'm going to come to that comparing Paiutes and whites. And then in 1940, there's a significant increase um, in households, uh, again, largely in the uh, uh, white population, a decrease in the uh, Paiute population. But between 1930 and 1940, there are, there are amazing changes in the basin. Basically, between nine, and there's no farms left. Right. Well, what happens? Not only is there the Great Depression, but the LADWP gets control over the, all the basin and all of the dwellings in the basin are removed by 1940. Um, and the uh, uh, West Portal is, I don't know how many people, Dave, how many people were in the West Portal? Thousand? Down. So, yeah, it, it just completely transformed. But these people, you know, in 1940, there are 220 households, 611 um, whites in the Mono Basin. But basically, the farming community is wiped out. It's gone. It might have gone anyway, even if DWP hadn't taken it all, because the main source of demand for agricultural goods um, in Bodie, in Lundy, and in the Mono Mills, all those went away. Um, and so the uh, the farming community didn't have much of a, a chance of of succeeding for a long time anyway, which is why there's so much uh, machinery in front of the uh, museum. <laughs> you know, just leave it there. You know what the hell we're we gonna do with it. 
Um, so um, over here, we've got um, the, again, this is just census data, U.S. census data. Um, the number of uh, households in of the Paiutes um, remains pretty much the same from 1990 to 1920. Um, a slight increase by, to 1930. Um, dwellings, purses, persons, and then I'm going to get over to this section at, in more detail in a bit. Um, but there were a significant number, it turns out to be 10 um, Paiute families who came into what in effect was land ownership. And a significant number of them were farming and ranching. And again, that's not part of the stories we tell about the Mono Basin at all. Now let's go over here. Um, I simply took, again, this is US census data. What percentage of the population of the Mono Basin at any given time are Paiutes? Even though, again, they don't show up very much in most of the uh, histories. So 20% 20, 20 or so um, into uh, the 1920s. Then the population percentage of Paiutes goes up to 32% uh, in uh, 1930, and it drops again to 14%, uh, according to the US Census in 1940. Um, and so there's significant numbers of people and households um, in, the, in the entire basin, but the, uh, I'm gonna inquire into whether or not we can trust these figures on the uh, local Paiute population. That'll come toward the end of my presentation. Okay? okay, figures don't include Lundy or Mono Mills. All right, so I began the, the process of, of inquiring um, how accurate were those uh, census enumerators in 1900, 1910, 1920. Um, and there was one way I could check, and that was with um, the great register of the state of California, the great register of the county of Mono, um, is a list of all of those registered voters. So this is male citizens over 21 and over. Okay, and I, I took uh, the 1896-1898 Great Register because that was close to the uh, census data for 1900 to be able to get a, a look at this. So <laughs> here's what it looks like. Yeah, more data than you can care about. But we got Benedict up here, and I'm gonna come to a bet. Henry Burrow in just a second. But what I was interested in is the business or occupation. Uh, you know, what the hell is Henry Cal, 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 Calvin? A speculator, huh? What's he speculating in? But what I'm interested in is ranchers, stock ranchers, farmers, farmers, labor, ranchers. We got John Matley, we got all kinds of these folks. Again, names that, uh, that you know, uh, Louis DeChambeau, James Curry, um, and others. And you probably don't need to know how, what their height is, what their complexion is, the color of their eyes, color of their hair. But if you sit at a voter, uh, you know, if you're taking votes, you need to know what these folks uh, look like because otherwise, what are we afraid of? Fraud. Okay, so, so, so scroll, scroll, scroll over there a little bit. I want to take a look at, at okay, post, uh, keep going, keep going. Able to read the Constitution in English. I think we should require that of people running for office. Able to write, yes. Physically able to mark your ballot. And here's poor, poor old, let's see, I forgot his name already. Burroughs, Henry Burroughs. He's 86. He's not able to physically mark his ballot. And this is something that we can, we can actually empathize with. Why? Nature of, get over there. Come on, get on, come on. Nature of his. Oh, nature of his disability. Nervousness. Ah! <laughs> okay, so, so what I did with, with this, other than having some fun with it, was, was to, to take all, the, all of the people who are identified as being farmers, ranchers, or stock raisers, or anything like that, that I could look at and compare with the 1900 census on farmers and ranchers. There are 25, uh, farmers or ranchers mentioned in the uh, uh, in the uh, 1900 census. Did I do that? Okay. So I just did this. I, I spent a lot of time on this, and coal was 
he was great. He gave me all kinds of information. He did a wonderful presentation on food in the Mono Basin um, after 1850, and he had a lot of this stuff. And a lot of the detail on what you actually is gr being grown here, we can go back and get from Cole's presentation. Several months ago, Cole, when was that? April. Okay, so six months, so oh, four months ago. Anyway. It's a great presentation, and I borrowed some of the slides that he used as well. Okay, so um, the, the Great Register of 1896-98, um, but not in the census, who are li listed as farmers or ranchers. There's a whole bunch of them who, who escaped the, uh, the census. What, what, was that guy a slacker? I mean, did he take a day off? What's going on? And then I did it the other way. They're in the census, but not in the Great Register. There are four people here, and a couple of them, we know why they're not in the Great Register, because they're not citizens yet. Leo Matley's uh, Swiss, he's, he's not, got an Italian. I don't know what Barnard and Chipman's problems are, but they weren't in the, uh, the census either. Uh, they were in the census, but they weren't registered to vote. Yeah, so anyway, I tried to do this. I tried to get a handle using other sources to, to check what the information is coming from the uh, U.S. Census. Um, and here's the uh, farm schedule from the 1900 census. Um, all the 25 named farmers or ranchers in the basin, um, and there are 25 of them. And, and again, these are a lot of the names of people that, that reading the, uh, the memoirs and other things we come across and see some of them aren't. Sylvester is sometimes spelled with an I. Um, Jerome LeBrock, we've got uh, Lily, Matthew's uh, stories about him, and then Louis Chambeau, De Chambeau. So a lot of these are names that we know and are probably enshrined over at the Pioneer Pavilion as well. Um, oh, I gotta go back, I gotta go back. So the, there's 25 farming or ranching families accounting for 106 people in the Mono Basin. The total white settler population in 1900 was 150 persons. So the farming population is over two thirds of the total population of the basin. And you know, that sort of makes sense. That, that's the main thing that people are, are coming here for um, is, is to farm. Um, so there are a couple of other sources on what farms might have looked like. Um, in the uh, Mono Basin, there's two, uh, two memoirs. Um, Lily Matthew, man from Mono, um, is saying these are the, and you have to, the museum has a couple of larger views of this and also of uh, uh, the next one. But uh, Lily Matthew, this is, she's showing this uh, of the Mono Basin in 1890, but she wasn't born until 1922. So, you know, um, a memoir is a memoir. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the less I remember. You know, it just, it just is. Okay, so let's take a look at, uh, the, uh, the next one, this is uh, um, Margaret Calhoun's map of the basin in 1900. And I think this one you can get in a 24 by a huge poster size from the museum. Um, but yeah, keep going, keep going up, keep going up. Here we go, Margaret Calhoun. Um, she was born in 1889, so at least she was 11 years old. And you know, she, she says, there are probably other settlers whom I have forgotten, but at one time we could count 30. You know, and that's not a bad estimation as to how many um, settler farmers and ranchers there were in the basin. And I took all those names, I took the names on, the, uh, on Lily Matthews' map, and I put them next to all the names that I had from the census and the names from the, uh, the register, and I drove myself nuts. And I, I can't figure this out. Okay, so another way to get a handle on this um, is work that, that I've done um, using the land registers and land ownership records of Mono County um, to get a handle on this. And I want to take a couple minutes to explain what you're looking at. Well, obviously, you got Mono Lake here. Um, but each of these squares is um, a surveyor's township. And each square is six miles by six miles. And so each of these squares is one square mile. And Dave knows this uh, very well because he wrote the, wrote the book on Von Schmidt 
Um, but the uh, the surveying of not just simply the Mono Basin, but of California and then the rest of the country as well, other than the 13 colonies, um, was a system by which, in effect, an administrative net was thrown over all of these lands that were considered to be not the people who lived there, not their land, but it was claimed to be U.S. government land. So by this act of surveying, the Kazetika were dispossessed of their land. Um, and what the, uh, what the U.S. government did once it had this system of surveys is that meant that the land could be parceled, located precisely, and then sold or given away or however it was. So these initial transfers of what became known as public land or government land, which had been Kazetika land, into private hands um, from 1872. 1872 is the first. These are called patents, land patents. They're not called deeds. They're called land patents. Um, 1872 to 1925. Uh, the first land patent that I found uh, in the Mono Basin was to Joseph Bowler of Bowler Canyon. So that's the first one. Um, and what I did is I got the records of every single one of those people, 188 of them. And you can print off the plot map, the survey map for each of these areas. And this was this this particular one, which is Rush Creek and uh, Lee Vining Creek. I'm going to show a little bit more detail. Um, this is known as one. Um, North, 26 East. In other words, this is this is von Schmidt's prime meridian here, Mount Diablo meridian, going all the way over to San Francisco Bay Area. <clears throat> and this, there are 25 other <clears throat> sections like this going over to the Bay Area. And this is one north, and it goes way to heck up there, and then it goes way down there as well. <coughs> this one is one south. I mean, this is one south, 26 east. So what you're seeing, looking at here, is um, a map that nobody's seen before. So go, okay, so here we go. So um, what you, every one of these squares is, uh, land that has been privatized and handed into uh, private land ownership. Um, that happened largely through two government giveaways that are really important. One is the Homestead Act and the other is the Desert Land Act. Homestead Act of 1862 and the other act is the uh, Desert Land Act of 1877. Um, and to get a homestead or land under the Desert Land Act, you had to settle on it you had to claim it you had, in the language of the uh, the act and then of all the documents. You had to enter it. And they were known as entry men. Um, but then to keep to get the actual patent after that, you had to improve it. You had to improve the land. You had to put buildings on it. You had to start farming. You had to transform it from what it was, Kazetika land, into what it isn't, and that is a farm that looks like it came out of the middle middle west, right? With wheat and alfalfa and all kinds of other stuff. And so I I mapped all of these, and of course, um, 188. I should say that there's only 10 additional patents over here on the east and the south part of um, the Mono Basin. And I just trust me, it took me a long time to get this all together, so I, I didn't want to get it up there, but um, the largest number of patents is in the uh, Rush Creek area. Here's Grant Lake down here, and here's Lee Vining Creek. Um, and the reason is because here's where the water is, right? Um, we've got <clears throat> up here, I didn't draw it in so you couldn't see it, but Mill Creek is up here, and then uh, uh, Wilson Creek is over here. Um, but most of the water to, in the north um, comes from springs and wells, not being diverted from um, <clears throat> streams, because there is a, a clay pan um, underneath the soil here, uh, some six to eight 
uh, feet below the surface where the water seeps in and it's a very uh, short water table distance so you can get a, a well dug pretty quickly and you can get, there's springs popping up all over the place up there. Um, last year, I forgot his, the guy's name, who did a presentation on all the springs. And does anybody remember his name? Randy, yeah, yeah. So he's, he's, he's been, you know, that's where all those springs and uh, um, waterways come from. And the, uh, I did a very quick, um, analysis of the uh, of these 188 um, 157 are 84% uh, are Euro American um, males 12 women Sarah noise is one of those I gave, gave Jill the uh, patent for that land um, but there's also 12 Paiutes spelled with no A, but I-U-T. That's like it was spelled on the U.S. Census in 1900, 1910. Um, and then there's Paiutes with an A, um, and this comes from uh, a spelling that is adopted by the U.S. government after 1920 or so. And there's about 10% of this total, 19, um, are um, Paiutes who, in one way or another, as we'll see, it's called land allotments, um, got land as well. And I'm going to talk about them in more detail as we go along. Um, but anyway, pretty you just it's a visual impression of what it looked like. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that there's 188 of these land patents. Trust me on that. Uh, uh, and to get these patents, they had to improve the land. So I don't know if that's digging a uh, uh, you know an outhouse ditch or what. Um, but they're not all farms, because we know that there's maybe 25, 30, or 40 farms. So they're not all farms. Um, and then we get into the interesting questions of, of other stories, but um, the, once, once land gets transferred from public land ownership to private land ownership, guess what you can do with it? You can sell it. And so what happens in a very, very short period of time is that there is a process of land concentration of ownership. And a guy's name who you've, I'm sure, heard of, J.S. Kane, comes to own and control 80% of the land in the Mono Basin by 1923 and claims to also control 99% um, of the water rights. Um, Barry's grandfather, who started the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company, he got nothing. Got no land rights, no water rights, no nothing. Uh, there's a long story about that. It's in some of the other uh, articles I have coming out or already out. Okay, so. All right, so this is just getting a sense as to how many um, settler farms and ranches there are in the Mono Basin. Uh, approximately half the settler households, but two-thirds of the population, and about one-third of Paiute households are farmers or ranchers. So farming and ranching um, as a human activity um, in the Mono Basin was not simply to provide sustenance for the farming and ranching family, it was for export. That was the whole point. Um, and these... Uh, Operations were fairly large, and I've got some photographs I'll show you. Um, <clears throat> but the act of farming transforms the environment. And I'll go into a little bit more about how that is. Um, and in place of the environment or ecosystem that was there, um, an agroecosystem gets established. The farmers select plants and animals that they want and transform the environment and get rid of plants and animals they don't want. And those become pests or weeds. Um, and unfavored species can become uh, extinct. And there's vast numbers of uh, ex species extinctions around the world from 1800 on. Um, but if not um, um, extinct, they become extirpated and taken out of the area. And that happens uh, with sheep and pronghorn antelope in the Mono Basin. Think about this. You're looking out there from, say, May or June until um, September, October, and you see 
This is in 1908. You see 200,000 sheep. John Muir called them hooved locusts and busy little nibblers <laughs> because they, they chow down everything. They're not as bad as goats, but they chew, chow down everything. And so what these sheep did is they destroyed the food sources for the pronghorn that were in the eastern and southern parts of the Mono Basin. And this is Sedges, Forbes. Muir describes the Mono Basin when he got down here in 1869 in August as being green and lush. And so the pronghorn had all kinds of sources of, of uh, food for them, uh, but the sheep destroyed it. And so there's pronghorn up in the Bodie Hills, but they're not around here anymore. Um, so I'm going to turn to uh, water diversions, and then we've got fertilizer and machinery. And I've got one photograph of fertilizer is a big question, because when you grow stuff, it takes essential nutrients out of the soil. And to keep farming for more than three to four years, you've got to put the nutrients back. If you don't put the nutrients back, the soil is destroyed. Um, and machinery. So we go from horse power to steam and then gas power. So neither of these machines are in, the, uh, in front of the uh, museum. But these were machines that the Rush Creek Mutual Ditch Company was using in 1918 um, to dig its ditches. But look at the size of this, this thing. This is a steam engine. That's another, this is a caterpillar. Um, but look at that thing. I mean, it's just churning out huge amounts of, of dirt and moving it from one side to another. And of course, we can see the remnants of all these ditches throughout the, throughout the basin. You can see them with um, um, uh, Google Earth. They're out there. You know, you're walking around, you stumble into a ditch, and you say, what the hell is this? Well, that's, that's what it is. Um, so a couple of other ways of getting a handle on what's going on. This is one section of one of the, uh, the surveys. This shows John Matley's uh, uh, acreage and John Hammond's acreage. And this is a pretty interesting part of the, of the map. Um, Matley's house is about where the Mono Inn is. This is all north of Lee Vining. Um, Hammond's place is the Tioga Inn, so you sort of know where you're at here, right? Um, and so uh, these cross hatches are fields. Um, and, oh, it's cleverly labeled, fields. <laughs> That's how I knew what that was, right? I broke the code. And then down here, we've got a fairly large swampy area. Could, I, that says swampy. That's how I knew it was swampy, <laughs> right? Um, and then we've got a fence, blacksmith shop, and go up to uh, John uh, Matley's place up here, Matley's house, and then we've got uh, land up here. Each of these sections is 40 acres, by the way, so that's a fairly good mark. It looks like uh, uh, Matley's farming about maybe a quarter of his, uh, so that'd be 10 acres. And that's that's a fairly large garden, but that's, you can have it for yourself or sell it as well. Um, but we get a little bit larger. This is Jake Matley's ranch um, in 1922. Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> what became Highway 395 out here. Um, it was a dirt road, a county road until then. And of course, we're looking out to the Mono Cowns. Um, and on the other side of the, uh, the road, you can see we get into um, a fairly sparse, it looks like, uh, sagebrush landscape. Um, but Matley's got 480 acres here. And we've got uh, the, the hay rick here is probably a, um, a stable of one form or another, but that's a lot of land to transform sagebrush into farmed land. Um, Thompson Ranch, this is to the northwest of, uh, this is probably Cemetery Road here, but we're, again, we're looking out toward Black Point, um, and here's he's got some uh, uh, dairy cattle down here. Um, this is a photograph that shows him wandering through his alfalfa um, again down and you got other crops growing here but again a, a pretty good sense as to how the uh, the landscape was changed um, fruit trees were planted in here cherries apples others as well none of these were uh, there um, originally so we got transformation of the environment 
Um, here's a Sylvester Ranch. This is a little bit, this is to the west of 395. Again, looking, looking east, Black Point is out here. And the reason I like this one um, is because it shows how much of the northern part of the basin had been transformed into farms. And remember the, uh, the map that I showed you, this is not the heaviest uh, uh, area of transfers of property into uh, private hands. That's in and around Rush Creek and uh, Lee Vining Creek. Um, so farms and ranches transformed the land and that transformed the environment. It's a major remaking of the landscape and I tried to figure out uh, the total area and I couldn't do that. Uh, I did mention I'm gonna, I had a whole nother section in here, but I took it out. Um, the uh, US Census enumerators, they had schedule one, which was people and schedule two was farms. And I got to look at the blank forms for this farm schedules. Oh man, it was everything you ever wanted to know about what the farms were, how much was in this, how much was in that, how much head of this, how many chickens they had, how many eggs. It was, it was like heaven. I could answer all the questions I needed to know. So I wrote to the National Archives and I said, do you happen to have these schedules? And I got back an answer, uh, no, they were destroyed. Um, throughout the country, there's only five counties in Kentucky that have these schedules and they probably, well, they're in a world of hurt the way it is, but I'm sure not, they're not bemoaning not having their, I mean, are, are celebrating having the farm schedules. And so new plants and animals displace the native ones, right? These are farm animals, farm goods. Uh, so the major transformation of land was actually irrigation. Um, wells, I mentioned that, diversions, ditches, and uh, Winslow Ney called these waterworks the live and runny waters. The live and running waters, he's talking about Lee Vining Creek, captured and directed by humans. I mean, I, I just think this is just such, such a wonderful turn of phrase that it's not just the animals and the plants that are live and running, but it's the water itself, which is live and running. So here's, um, here's where this comes from. Um, William Ney, Winslow Ney, um, makes a notice of water claim in 1888. And this is a, uh, a Mono County plat map from 1892 that shows where the Ney, family, Ney property was. That's right here. Um, right, and if you had to think about this, the, and I've got another slide, but 395 goes this way, Lee Vining is sort of over here um, now, and the visitor center is about over here, overlooking the Nay properties, to give you some sense as to where this is. Okay, so let's go back. I just wanna read to you how, what, what Nay was doing. He wanted to capture water from Levining Creek and direct it from the creek, which was going out over Matley land onto his land. I, not all, but he just wanted to get, how much did he get? Okay, he's a real estate owner near the mouth of this stream. I want to appropriate 1,000 inches. That meant how much water can get through a four inch pipe in a minute. You know, that's, that's known as an inch. It's about one and a half cubic feet. Uh, 1,000 inches of the live and running waters. I love that. And if this, you could, you could claim, you could get water rights. This notice is posted on a quake and aspen tree. That's how you do this. You go, boom, boom, my water. And the biggest, the biggest stealers of water this way was J.S. Kane. And that is still coming to bite us because uh, those of us who live in June Lake have to deal with SCE um, and it's uh, relicensing. It's, it's a nightmare. Anyway, so um, we're in this same, same area. Here's the Nay property. And he gets between he, the time that he made that um, posting in 1888 and 1892, this has all been transformed into meadow and he's growing stuff there. I don't know what he's got there. Um, and Mrs. Matley, this becomes Chris Matley's land 
And Leonard Matley has this land at the mouth of uh, Levine and Creek up here. So in 1902, a fellow by the name of Henry Jameson gets this land as a land allotment because he's a Paiute Indian. I'm gonna talk about this. So this is, this is Indian land or an Indian's land. And Chris Matley, who now owns this, says, I would like to get some more water to my land. But now, Henry Jameson owns the creek. So he obviously went to uh, Henry Jameson and said, um, I'm willing to buy water rights from you so that I can take water from Levining Creek and put it on, take it onto my land. So for the sum of $12, assigns forever, forever, all that certain right of way for a ditch through his land. Constructed above the LeBrock ditch known as the North May ditch, a sufficient distance so as not to interfere. This is really interesting and important um, for a lot of reasons, and I'm gonna come back to more of, more of it. Um, but um, what we have, uh, and by the way, Henry Jameson is also known, um, and he comes up in the, uh, the memoirs by uh, Calhoun and uh, LeBrock, um, in regard to the killing of Sheriff Dolan in 1915. Long story here. But the, uh, the culprits um, are fleeing and they're heading off someplace. And so the, uh, the posse decides that they need to get the best tracker in the Mono Basin to track these guys. And who do they find? Henry Jameson, right? But his name, he's in one of the memoirs, he's known as Jimson. In another one, he's uh, not. Anyway, interesting guy, interesting guy. So, now we're down into, here's Levining Creek and here's, um, um, this is Rush Creek and we've got uh, Parker Creek there. And let's see, I guess this is Walker here and Parker is here, there we go. All right, so um, the first ditch taking water out of, uh, the big one, first biggest one taking water out of Rush Creek is put together by two guys by the name of uh, Thomas Keyes and Clarence Brown. And what they wanted to do is get water from Rush Creek down to their land, which they, this is Desert Land Act. And so to improve their land, to get title to the land, they had to bring water to it. And so they build a ditch over three years from 1902 to 1905 that runs about 11 miles. How the hell did they do that? I think two mules and a, a scraper would do that. Um, anyway, uh, that's the beginning of the uh, the transformation of the water landscapes of the Mono Basin. Um, but the uh, the real maker of the of the uh, water landscape is J. S. Kane and the Kane Irrigation Company and all of his subsidiary power companies and everything else. By 1923, as I said, Kane owns 80% of the land and claims to own 90 93% of the or 99% of the water rights. Um, and if you can see this, let me make that a little bit larger. This is Levining Creek going down here. And you see all of these other ditches now that are bringing water to lots of other places in and around. This is all, this is mostly Matley land over here and Matley land up there. Um, and then I've made a, a blow up of this area. This is Rush Creek and Grant Lake down here. Uh, so just go over to the next one we can get a sense as to how big this is. So here's Grant Lake. And uh, this is the first ditch. I think this is uh, the key, Brown and Key Ditch. And this is the second one. This goes out this way. This is basically, this runs right next to the, return, the existing return ditch. So the return ditch currently is taking water back up to Rush Creek, right? And if you go out to, to the return ditch and just look to the downhill side, you'll see the, you'll see this, the remains of this ditch. Um, but anyway, you can see they've got ditches out here, they've got ditches out here, got, you know, just basically transforming the hydrology of the, uh, the Mono Basin. And some of you may know this, but what did Kane do with his monopoly on land and water rights in 1923? He made an offer to sell them 
for $7 million to, guess who? L.A. <laughs> and Mulholland said, not interested. We got the Colorado River we can empty. So they went on and built the uh, Colorado water uh, operations. Okay, so what are irrigating do? You think it was for growing crops. Actually, the, the watering was mostly used to kill sagebrush. It, that's, what, that's what it was used for. You, you put water out there and you kill the sagebrush. And then after you kill the sagebrush, then you can spread grass seed, alfalfa seed. You can do all kinds of other things with it. But that's mainly what it, whoop, what it did. Got to go back. Um, and if, you, if you're coming down the, uh, the Conway grade and you stop at the overpass, especially in the winter, and you look down at the uh, Conway Ranch, you can see this big patch of gold, which is uh, the grasses that were grown in the, by the Conway Ranch after they killed off all of the, uh, <clears throat> off the uh, sagebrush. And you can see the same thing uh, up to the uh, west of uh, 395, where the Cane Ranch House is. And you look up in there between uh, uh, Parker Creek and then 395, and that's all grass as well. And that's all stuff that was put in there and grown um, as a result of the uh, killing of the sagebrush by, um, by irrigation. So we're going to come back now to uh, some of the uh, information that's on here. This is, again, this is, the, this is what the uh, U.S. Census tells us. Uh, okay, five more minutes. Five, five minutes? Okay, we've got five minutes. Okay. All right. Um, and we, we've gone over this, but what I want to do now is to look at um, the uh, official U.S. Census figures of Paiute Indians in the Mono Basin. And so how do I interrogate and say, are you telling us the truth? Well, it turns out that there are two additional censuses of Mono Basin Paiutes. There's long stories that go behind each of these. One was done in 1905-1906 by a guy by the name of Charles Kelsey. Um, who was the head of the Northern California Indian Association, which was trying to do good by getting land, land, land into the hands of landless, landless Indians. And the first thing they need to know is how many Indians we got. Um, and so he, this, the uh, data I'm going to show you is just for Mono County. He did 36 counties in Northern California, came up with pretty interesting numbers. Uh, the other uh, source of information is the... Uh, Bishop Indian Agency also conducted censuses of uh, Paiutes in the Mono Basin um, over three periods, 1914 to 16, 1927, and 1937. So I'm looking at two additional sources of uh, censuses and to compare them with the, uh, the U.S. Census data on Paiute Indians. So this is Kelsey's census. And you get the name of a person, you get the heads of families, and the number of people in the family, right? You get Frank Couch and wife and two children and somebody's mother for five people. So you got the number of families, um, and then you've got, uh, but you don't have the names of, of any of the people there. But you got number of families and then the total number of people. Okay. Um, the Bishop Agency Census roll is a little bit more detailed. Um, this, tell, this, this includes all of Mono County, so it tells you where they are. So Mono Lake, we've got Frank Abe. We've got his date of birth and the other people in his family um, and their relationship. And sometimes they have dates of birth and sometimes they don't. It's not as accurate as the U.S. Census in that regard. Um, so we've got these two, two additional sources of information on individuals. We, this, this is disaggregated down to the family level, you know? You can't make people up, right? They're either counted and they're, they're real or they're not. Okay, so let's compare the U.S. Census with the Kelsey and Bishop Agency censuses. Of Paiutes spelled two different ways. Um, in the U.S. Census in 1900, there were 39 uh, Paiutes in 14 households. Um, in 1906, um, the Kelsey count has 100 in 27 households. The Bishop Agency, for you know, 15 years later, has 182 in 30 households. 
and co as compared to 57 or so in 1920 in the US Census. I know there's a U undercount of minority people in the US Census. I'm shocked. <laughs> you know. But if you think that, uh, that the US Census undercounts and that these other censuses are more accurate, then what we have is the households and the individuals um, leads, if you use the, the enumeration in the US Census of whites as being fairly accurate, but wrong on the Paiutes. That means that, that instead of, of a fifth or a third of the population in, Mono, in the Mono Basin being Paiutes, um, 40 to 60% are Paiutes, maybe 50% which is a huge uh, population that's is kind of invisible, kind of invisible. So um, among the things that, uh, the stories that we don't know about and that I'm excavating is that some of these pilots, about a third of the enumerated ones, uh, come into land ownership. And they do this through the California Indian uh, land allotment system. And they can apply for and get an allotment of land up to 160 acres, if they can prove that they're Indians, and tr uh, the paperwork for proving you're an Indian is really extensive, trust me, it's, it's, it's amazing what they had to do. Um, and they had to agree to, uh, to improve the land, that is to farm it or ranch it or do other things with it. And the other thing was that the, they didn't have outright ownership of it, it was held in trust by the US government for 25 years. That was, the US government had full ownership, and rights, and that turned out to work both ways for the uh, the allottees, as they're known. But and I think it's important to know the names of these people, right? And I've got them on this map. Again, this is this is just if, and here's Rush Creek, here's Lee Mining Creek. So we've got John Cluett on Rush Creek. He died uh, in 1907, just when he got this. We've got a fellow by the name of Fee Foster again on Rush Creek. We've got Bridgeport Tom over here. This is uh, basically where the Kutzetica started their uh, walk. This is at the uh, beginning of, of uh, Bloody Canyon Trail. And there's reasons why he wanted land there. Next to him is George Sam, number seven. Um, then we've got uh, Louis B. Murphy. He's over here, again, on Rush Creek. This is, this is the Narrows right here. Got uh, Mike Williams here. And if you've ever been up on those narrows, you can see the water gushing through there. You know what's on that land. This is this could be considered to be close to you know, it's it's of historic significance to the Kazetica and it's of cultural heritage, right? And so um, Lewis B. Murphy had that land. Okay, um, and actually, Bridgeport Tom and uh, George Sam lands continues down this way as well. And here's uh, Henry Jameson's land up here. There's two others who aren't on this map. Um, uh, Joe McLaughlin has land down here, basically strad straddling over Rush Creek. And his land was so strategically interesting that both the city of Los Angeles and J.S. Kane wanted it. And when those two forces go to battle, um, Joe McLaughlin didn't get screwed out of his land. J.S. Kane initially offered him $2,000 for it. For various reasons, the uh, Bishop Agency said, no, you can't take that. In fact, we're gonna send it out to bids. Send it out to bids, and then uh, the city of Los Angeles got into bidding. The uh, price went up to $4,500, and still the Indian Agency said, that's not good enough. Um, we, we wanna get more, and so ultimately, Joe McLaughlin in 1923 sold his land to a cane company um, for uh, $6,700. You know, three times what cane initially offered him. Now, $6,700 in the $1923 is something on the order of $150,000 in current dollars. So it's like real money, right? And then Captain John, he's up there to the, uh, the north of the basin. He's got the 80 acres up there. He was the leader of the Kazetica tribe in the 19, uh, 1870s and 1880s into the 1890s, 1900s. Uh, and we know uh, and are learning a whole lot more about him as well. Um, so, landowners, 
Paiutes are landowners in the Mono Basin. 10 had land patents, nine were farmers. Uh, Captain John's got a dry piece of land and he's still cultivating about uh, an acre of uh, land up there. In the US Census, three. In 1910 and an additional two more in 1920. US Census undercounted the total numbers of Paiutes and those owning and ranching land in the Mono Basin. Conclusions. This is, you know, I could do a so what kind of thing, but we got some conclusions in. Oh, I'm oh, five, seven minutes over. We're good. Okay, so when we think about the environmental changes to the Mono Basin um, over the last hundred years or so, um, we can just take take a look at the uh, the machinery in front of the uh, the historical society. Uh, we can we can read the stories that come from the Mono Lake Committee. Um, and it's all in the hands of, uh, of Euro-American settlers, um, or if you want to consider the uh, uh, city of LA colonizers, um, in remaking the landscape and the uh, environment of the Mono Basin before 1940. Um, Cusetica, Piutes were rather dramatically undercounted in the US Census. US Census has Piutes at 20 to 30%, I would say probably 40 to 60 percent, and this is this is really part of the big takeaway, though, is that it's not all Euro-American settlers who are doing the transforming, who are doing the building, who are doing the farming, who are doing the creating, who are maintaining families from generation to generation. Uh, Pilot ranches and farms are also an important role in the new economy of farming and ranching in the Mono Basin, and contributed on the downside to the transformation of the Mono Basin environment and landscape. <clears throat> now, three weeks ago, I was reading the LA Times. I don't know how many of you read the comics. I mean, I read them every day. But this was on the 12th of, uh, Jan of July. So, little girl, he's, he's Fraz is a uh, janitor in a elementary school. Little girl says, why do people water their plants in parts of the country where there's no water? Fraz says, because they grow things that aren't native to those regions. The little girl says, and why would they do that? Fraz says, they want where they went to look like where they're from. Trans transform the landscape into Midwestern farms. Every answer just raises another question, the little girl bemoans. And Fraz says, some transplants can't adapt and some transplants won't. I was working on this and that just happened to be in the paper at the same time. So there we go. Um, comments, questions, where, I don't know where we're at here. Um, did Kane sell his water rights to LA Water and Power? Um, ultimately, I mean, you think that LA, the story is that LA Water and Power gets, gets the, uh, the land and water rights in the LA Basin as a result of the Aiken decision uh, in 1933 where they can condemn the water. In the meantime, Kane sold all of his water rights plus those of Matley's and Farrington's to the city of Los Angeles for five and a half million dollars in 1933. So the answer is yes, but it wasn't in 1923, it was a decade later. I, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, that was pre, yeah, yeah. okay. I have a question for, yeah. for the society, for the museum. Um, I would like, I suggest that since we have your expertise and your your research and your data, that uh, that our historian and our curator and, and you know, you know that, that we really take a good hard look at uh, uh, interpreting some of this information about the forty to sixty percent or whatever. Um, there, I, it does strike me that the um, the school class photos. Um, we could. I, I'd be interesting to see if we, you know, if we can identify percentage of uh, 
you know, Paiute uh, children that are in those class loads. Yeah, we, we can actually get some of that information from the U.S. Census because there is that, can this person read, write, and speak English? And for most of the kids, the answer is yes. And so the children of the Paiute families are going to school, and they're probably going to school with Crater School and elsewhere as well. Um, and um, so there's, there is hard data. We can get some numbers on that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, yes, we do. It's it's fun. You're welcome. Yeah. Did you have a question, Priscilla? Okay. I uh, just wanted to remind everyone that um we will not have a meeting or presentation in September because we will have just finished the ghost tour. And we have one more drawing this evening for the people that came tonight. We have an upside down water bottle, upside down house water bottle. And it goes to Bob Marks. <laughs> It really wasn't a setup. That's really funny. Here you go. And uh, you can fill it with ever, anything you like to hydrate with. All right. Well, just another reminder, ghost tickets. Uh, we'll have the uh, 26th and 27th. And um, they are, we're, we're doing pretty good, but we, uh, we really like to get them sold early so we can plan. It makes it a lot easier for the folks that are providing food. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. It was a very entertaining, informative presentation. Thank you. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all at the ghost. Thanks.